so you just move on to that's who I am. <laughs> you just move on to the next. So, um, you know, if we stop and think about what it is that we're trying to do here, um, there's so much happening in the way of genetics and uh, genomics, and it's a really exciting field. But as exciting as it is, it it really uh, what we're about. Um, is to put those appropriate applications um, directly into activities that are going to influence the health of individuals and the families uh, and, the, and the public. Next slide. And so people, so I'm going to just talk a little bit at sort of a very high level here. You know, people enter into the genetic system at a lot of different potential points um, along the lifespan. Um, certainly within the reproductive um, arena, there's um, that's been a long-standing area where people interface with genetics, newborn screening uh, as a public health program. Within the pediatric uh, or adolescent community, when there are e is either a fa family history or clinical symptoms that suggest a then an individual may have um, a condition that has a genetic etiology, and then of course a uh, much broader, uh, you know, adult onset disorder. Some of which are uh, single gene based, but many of which are more complex and more complex inheritance pattern. So people can, you know, there's many different points in any of our lifetimes where we may need to move in and out of the genetics arena, and sometimes it's a very short. Um, intersection with the genetics services community, for example, within the reproductive or newborn screening, you know, typically those results come back perfectly normal and, you know, the person or family just moves on and may even have forgotten that they had any genetic testing or interface with genetics at all. Um, but at other times, of course, the intersection with genetics is a much more complex relationship that ex that can be sustained over a long period of time. Um, next slide. So when we think about what is it that we need to have in place, whether it's that short intersection with genetics in the, some kind of a screening program or if it's a longer relationship with the genetics community, what do we really need to have in place? from the broad perspective to realize the promise of, of genomic medicine. And you can sort of click through all of these if, if you like. So first of all, of course, is the evidence that obtaining this genetic information is going to improve outcomes. And for many of our applications, we are still struggling with um, identifying the clear benefit of having a particular uh, genetics information, at least to the you know payers. Uh, um, level of, of evidence. But beyond that, uh, when we think about genetic services, we can think about it very broadly or very narrowly. So think of it from a broader perspective, what we need to obtain really good genetic medicine in, in, in this in, is to have, first of all, a healthcare system or healthcare providers who can identify those at risk individuals or families via either their family history or clinical symptoms and begin to think about, gee, this may have a genetic etiology and either refer to geneticists or if they have a, feel that they can handle some of it at their own um, uh, specialty or primary care level, do some of the initial testing and be able to use genetic information and treatment decisions. So that's the sort of broader healthcare system. And then of course, there needs to be access to the actual genetic service providers themselves so that no matter where an individual or family lives uh, in the United States, that there is, a, there is a, a delivery system where they can get direct access to perhaps a more narrow definition of genetic services, which is that genetic you know, evaluation. One, of course, would hope that there's payment for all of these services. And then lastly, once a diagnosis has been made, the individual uh, moves into a broader systems of care. And sometimes that is very condition specific, as in the case of a metabolic um, uh, condition. Uh, but sometimes it's a broader systems of care that any individual with a chronic health care problem needs access to. So all of 
these, I think, play a role. When we think of genetic services, we can think very broadly about everything, or we can think very narrowly and just about that uh, genetics um, referral. The next slide. So as, as you know, Ronnie Sue um, eloquently stated earlier, um, you know, the, what HRSA has been funding since 2004 are these regional genetic collaboratives to address some of these issues about access to care. And back in 2004, they were originally established because uh, at that time all of the uh, expanded newborn screening was ha was happening in it, so it was a, an infrastructure mechanism to help assist with some of the inequities in the distribution of access to specialists. Um, the next slide. And so for the last, uh, you know, over decade, um, the uh, regional collaboratives in conjunction with the National Coordinating Center, which is the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics, and Michael will be talking about their activities next, in conjunction with the National Genetics Education and Consumer Network, uh, network which uh, Genetic Alliance has been running to ensure that the, um, the consumer aspect of this is uh, that we don't you know, lose sight of really what's important here, which is the families that we serve. The next slide. And so I think over the last, you know, number of years, the regional collaborative um, infrastructure has really, um, um, you know, had a, a, has been very successful with what the intent of the network or the collaboratives were set out to do. Ronnie gave you some great examples of what uh, you know, your region has been doing in the way of many of those activities, but, you know, expanding broadly across all of the regions, you know, we've seen that the, the strength of the regional collaborative approach has been to develop the partnerships at that regional or state level to help leverage, you know, scarce resource, resources and to identify what are the gaps in those uh, regions that really need to be um, addressed, and then to um, develop in pilot, you know, projects and delay and collect data on it to try and improve these um, identified um, gaps. And some of this has led to, you know, policy papers and forums that, that have, you know, let, um, that have provided some guidance around the delivery of genetic services. So, next slide. And as Ronnie had, has also eloquently um, stated, what we've been asking ourselves over the NASC and the regional collaboratives over the last um, s several years is not just to say, here's all the things that I've been doing, um, but you know, what's the, what's the broader impact? What's the impact of what we're doing on that broader genetic medicine delivery model that we talked with earlier. So if you go to the next slide, I think I take us back. Oh, so the question is, before we get there, um, you know, do we keep doing what we're doing? You know, is this is this the best um, is is this the best model to keep going forward? This isn't 2004 anymore. So is there some some other way that we should be thinking of a regional approach to genetic um, services? And this is what we're beginning to think about here at um, TERSA and what we've engaged the uh, American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics is the National Coordinating Center to help, you know, think through about, uh, about going forward. Next, if you could move on to the next slide. You know, what, how, how it, it, you know, we wish we could address all aspects of, of genetic services, and I wish I had the, you know, we had the funding to be able to support everything that needs to be done, but of course, that's just not the realities of the system that we are in today. And so, so looking forward, what, what is the, the, the gap, the real gap in, uh, in access to genetic services that we need to, that, that HRSA is uniquely positioned to be able to address. What is the, if we could do one thing and do it really, really well over the next, you know, uh, you know, projecting out five years from now, what's that thing that we would want to be able to do? Are there people that we're not reaching that we should be um, trying to reach? Are there particular services that people are not
not getting at. So if, you, if you just click on to the next slide. So again, sort of thinking about this big system and, uh, you know, do, do we take the broad, do we take the narrow view? What's, what's the one thing that we should, uh, you know, we should direct our efforts on that we're collectively, we could really make an impact. Um, so that's what we're beginning to think about. And, um, and I think that's my last slide. Um, and you'll be hearing more from Mike in the next, um, with the, from Dr. Watson in the next session about some of the listening sessions that the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics have been doing to try and understand from me, from you all and from the other regional collaboratives and our the very many stakeholders on here, what what should we be what should we be doing going forward? So with with that, I'm going to stop. Um, I hope that came through clearly. It's a bit scratchy on my end, but um, do you want me to hang on, Ronnie? Yes, Joan, if you will just stay a second, I'm going to ask from the audience if they have any specific question for you. Is there, is there anyone who, would ha who has any question for Joan from the audience? <coughs> I will also say if there aren't any particular questions now, Jill, of course, is there. Feel free to, um, you know, to, to pass on any questions or comments to Jill directly, and I remain available, uh, you know, by phone or by, by email if anybody wants to reach out to me directly. And then, of course, the ACMG, as the National Coordinating Center, is also a place that you can um, that you can make um, comment to. Well, thank you very much, Joan. I really appreciate that.